The information provided on LifeInterruptedRadio.com is for educational purposes only. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's just my honor and pleasure to be with you here on another episode of the Autoimmune Hour. And tonight, I'm super excited because I've got a dear friend, a longtime member of my medical team that has gotten me to this place of optimizing my health every day, as well as someone who's going to talk to us about something that's really timely in my mind, and that's cold and flu season. So let me introduce her really quick. I'll just give you, she has an amazing long bio. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights, and then we'll talk to Dr. Jenny. And she has over 20 years as being a functional medicine and naturopathic doctor, and she works with chronic and intense and complicated conditions, shall I say. And you know, what I love about Dr. Jenny is she has walked this path too. It's not just from books that she knows about chronic and complicated conditions. She has cured herself from several chronic conditions. And we're going to have her talk to us about that a little bit. And then we're going to jump into cold and flu season and what can we do to stay healthy when everyone around us is coughing. So welcome, Dr. Jenny. Oh, I should say her name's Dr. Jenny Tefanky, and I didn't say her whole thing. We just call her Dr. Jenny. But uh, welcome, Dr. Jenny. (laughs) Thank you, Sharon, so much for having me in the Autoimmune Hour. I'm just honored to be here. I've heard so much about the show, and I just think your audience is fantastic, and thank you very much for having me. Oh, absolutely, and I loved your blog post and that wonderful PDF you have out on, I think it was something like flu prevention and treatment and uh, naturopathic strategies for for beating it, or uh, I'm paraphrasing the title there, everybody, but it's a great PDF. We'll tell you how to get that soon, but... You know, Jenny, sometimes it's nice for us to know that ha- that someone really gets us, and that's what I love about you. You've cured yourself from, I think it was chronic fatigue, right? Yes, twice, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. And that's what I love is because, you know, they, as the, everyone here on the Courage Club and the audience know, you know, it's nice to know that somebody gets us at that level, like yeah. what's really going on. So just tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. Well, I, I am just a huge fan of natural medicine. That's always been where I came from. But, and I actually got hit with chronic fatigue the first time when I was in medical school. I was a second year naturopathic physician and I had had a number of major traumas going in my life, including having a 17 week miscarriage and hemorrhage terribly. And that really put me in a downward slide where I went into something called chronic fatigue. I completely denied the diagnosis. I didn't want to be labeled as having chronic fatigue at the time. But once somebody put that label on me, I realized that it it did fit. And it took me a couple of years to figure out how to get out as a young young student and then as a resident, I threw everything I knew at this condition. I threw everything. And I always felt like it was a puzzle and every little thing had a piece. And the final piece for me was getting my mercury fillings out. And when that those came out and I detoxed from all that mercury, I felt good. I felt so good. I got what I call 150% better. I was able to have my full-time practice. I was teaching. I had another kid. I was house parent because my husband was gone all the time. I did everything. I called it big wave surfing because I could do so much. I was super fit. It was great. (laughs) And I was like, I'll never get it again, right? (laughs) And then, of course, I did. (laughs) and I ended up having a series of what I call the perfect storm where I had an injury that went into severe pain I couldn't sleep more than just a few hours at night because the pain was so bad and I I really went down that slide fast and I started I knew I was at risk and I I saw this looming hole of this fatigue last time I'd been in bed for months before I was able to even move to the couch. Like I was really, really sick. I was in bed with IVs in my arm for nutrition. Like I had it bad. (laughs) It was really Mm -hmm. serious. I was very, very sick. Um, I had ice up to my legs. My treatment team confessed later they were afraid I was going to die. I mean, that's how sick I was the first time I had it. So When I felt myself going there the second time, I was really scared. And I was really scared because I didn't want to go there. I was also scared because I had a practice that my family was dependent on my income. I had a huge overhead at my business. I I needed to work. I didn't have disability insurance like I'm sure many of your people don't either. So I knew I needed to get better, but I honestly didn't know how. Although I'd gotten better before, I knew you could get better. 
but I didn't really have know exactly the steps to get there. And this is, um, so I just put my head down and I couldn't sleep. So I just stayed up and I researched the heck out of everything and figured out how to get in my chronic fatigue, which is now what I, I do when I see my patients and what's like, what I practice and, and all of that. So that's kind of become my big thing. So that's my story around my, 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 <laughs> my fatigue. And I feel like I am back now. And now I understand why relapse is so common. And so now I teach my patients and the, and the physicians that I teach, I teach them how to help their patients avoid relapse. Well, I know that to one time I'm thinking of a wonderful story you told me about, I was having a relapse. Luckily, because of you and others on my medical team caught it early, this, this idea. So I didn't get quite as far as you had done, because obviously I had people on my team who'd been there, which is <laughs> important to know. I remember the story that you really helped me put it in perspective, because I remember coming and seeing you and I was pretty low, you know, sort of the woe is me uh, mask is what I was wearing. And I, I you remember telling you, and you had this wonderful metaphor. You said, Sharon, when I first met you, you were in this valley. You're way down here in this valley. And then we got you clear up, you know, to, uh, going up this mountain quite well. You've only slipped down a couple of steps of this mountain. You're not down in that valley. And, you know, just knowing that I wasn't down in that valley again, it really gave me some momentum. Like, okay, we've done it before. I haven't slipped so far that I'm starting over. Because honestly, my mind just started to race to like, oh my God, I, I, I'm having to start this all over again. And it was nice to hear that, no, you just slipped a little bit. <laughs> we'll, we'll get you back up the hill, which, which we did. And that's where this idea of optimizing every day comes into effect. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on about cold and flu season is just this last week, family member took an airplane flight, came home and within hours is just a wreck, fever, yeah. coughing up a lung, the whole thing. Yeah. And other than just sort of giving them the ghost sign, like, you know, stay away from me. Yeah, right. <laughs> I throw the food in the bedroom door kind of thing. <laughs> you know? Put it on the end of the rake and stick it through. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, you know, no offense. <laughs> but Love you, bud. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about some things. Uh, Obviously, I had read your great PDF and, and implemented those right away. And so far, so good. I'm feeling awesome. Luckily, they're on the mend as well. No one else in the family got sick. So that's good news. But you talk a lot about a toolbox. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about what a toolbox is and how we use it. Yeah, so I'm a big fan of having a toolbox. So I feel like you need a toolbox for all different levels of health. And I really see that we live on the physical level the mental, emotional level, and spiritual or energetic level. We really have all those bodies in us. And so we really need toolkits for all of those different places. And that's partly what allows people to stay more vibrant every single day. And I apply my toolkit every single day to different aspects of that. The, the flu PDF that I created is really a toolkit that helps people on mostly the physical, but has some emotional and some energetic tips in there too. But this is a toolkit so that you can keep your immune system supported. Uh, everybody is at risk for getting some kind of acute illness, but I really feel like people who are in the trenches or have had you know, chronic illness, they're more likely, they're more susceptible to getting ill and it's really great for them to have that toolkit in hand. It's something you can grab immediately and fix something. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, let's talk about it because one of the things that I was surprised when I read was, you know, the minute you start to think, uh-oh, am I getting a fever or uh-oh, that was an odd sniffle that went on too long or weird cough, you say go to the toolbox. Absolutely. And that's something that I think people who aren't used to using natural medicine, they don't really think about it. They think, oh, I'm getting that little sore throat. When I get home tonight, I'll take my whatever it is that you do. And, but instead, if you address it immediately, the, the sooner you can address an issue, the less likely you're going to allow time for that virus to replicate in your cells. That's what, that's what's going on when you're first getting sick is actually your immune system is starting to respond to this infection. So you want to support that immune system and get that viral replication down so that you can get better soon. So as soon as you can, it's great to, to take something. Okay. Take, well, we'll talk about what things to take, but I, I want to jump ahead because of when a family member comes home sick, the first thing I did was uh, 
anything they touched, I'm, I'm <laughs> desanitizing, <laughs> sanitizing, you know, disinfecting, or at least I think I am. I know you do a lot with essential oils. Can you give mm-hmm. us a couple of tips that like, okay, you touched that doorknob. <laughs> I just did this the other day. I had a couple patients in here with the flu. And so I was at the clinic and I just, I just went through and wiped down. There are a lot of essential oils that are just great for, that are wonderful disinfectants. Thyme is a fantastic disinfectant. Oregano is great. So thyme and oregano could be great. All the citrus oils work really well as anti-infective agents. Clove is just amazing. So you can use those as singulars or you can use them in conjunction with other things as well. Really the list goes on and on and on when we start talking about essential oils because they are so powerful, which is why you see them in so many natural products. Yeah, right. And there are, there are ways of wiping it down. I have these wonderful little essential oil um, sort of wipes mm-hmm. that I love because not just here at the home, I try to use, you know, natural cloths and things that I can wash and everything. But when I'm on the road, which as the audience and you know, I tend to be quite a bit. I love those wipes for like the plane, the hand rests on the plane, even... Even the other day, I was reading a study about how nasty the water and the bathrooms are in the plane that you shouldn't even wash your hands with that water. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, another one of those wipes. (laughs) Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love the wipes as well. And actually, that's what I did at the clinic. I took a natural wipe and then I added more essential oils to it just to up the up the level of disinfectant, natural disinfectant in there. And then I wiped down all the door handles and everything. (laughs) <laughs> and what I love is if people aren't familiar with you, you know, and on an airplane, mine are citrus flavored, the ones that are come in the little pack. And I, I don't know, they all start kind of looking at you strange. And then the next thing, you know, it sort of smells like a fruit salad in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, isn't a bad thing considered so the smell of some planes. But anyway, I digress there. <laughs> you know, I've heard of other things that we can use to disinfect with, but, uh, you know, things like vinegar. And um, I've always been concerned about some things like those um, hand sanitizers. They, mm-hmm. they seem like they'd be very harsh. Mm-hmm. I, I personally don't like the hand sanitizers. For years, I had multiple chemical sensitivity. I have figured out what caused that and I'm healing from that. So it doesn't bother me as much now. But I, I always, I'm always a fan of using what you need to use in the moment. So if all you have is a chemical sanitizer, that's maybe a better choice for you if you just came out of the outhouse, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it just may be a better choice. But if you have a, the ability to use something natural, I highly recommend it. I don't per- personally like the natural sanitizers because they have all the chemicals in them. Yeah. The, the pure organic alcohol sprays with essential oils, I think those are a great option for people who are not alcohol sensitive. They work well. They do cut down most of the viruses and bugs, but they don't kill the norovirus, which is a terrible gastrointestinal illness that's really infectious. And unfortunately, it doesn't kill that. So I, what I do if I am just using alcohol somewhere and I'm out somewhere, if I have the ability to just rinse my hands with cold water soon after, that makes a huge difference. Just the act of the water rushing down your hands washes a lot of things off. Yeah. Now... When you said cold water, a question came to mind. Mm -hmm. Not too long ago, someone mentioned to me the difference between hot water and, I'll say, room temperature water, Mm -hmm. not not ice water. But, Mm -hmm. and I was I was surprised they were recommending um, room temperature water over over hot water. Have you ever heard of that before? For washing your hands. For washing your hands, that the longer you wash, they were saying the long wash a long time in just uh, room slightly warm water, but not not super hot water. Um, otherwise, I don't know, they were saying something about hot water opens up your skin pores or something. And I, I was just curious about that, if you'd ever heard of anything. I know this is totally off topic, but... Yeah, yeah, no, it's fine. I, I have not seen any studies about hot water versus cold water versus warm water. I remember when our OSHA specialist would come and talk to us when we were in the medical school. And somebody asked, what temperature of water should we wash our hands with? And she said it doesn't matter, just wash your hands, but you're gonna wash longer if it's warm water. Now that said, I do, I can see if it's really, really hot water that that is going to open up the pores. What does that really do in terms of not being able to get your hands clean? I don't know, I'm not sure that, I I, I don't know. Yeah, I was just curious about that, but I feel better because I just can't 
my hands just anymore just don't tolerate super hot water. So okay. yeah. But I had learned a long time ago that <laughs> it sounds weird. You were supposed to brush your teeth while singing happy birthday in your head. So that was about three, four minutes. Uh-huh. And uh, so I just do that when I'm washing my hands too. So I make sure I wash them long enough. (laughs) That's a great idea. Yeah, it's absolutely great to have a song in your head that does it for long enough. You could choose a more interesting and different song if you like. (laughs) Maybe a (laughs) Beatles song or something might be more interesting. (laughs) Yes, definitely. The song song was not important. It was just, you know, row, row, row your boat or something. The song was not important. Just make sure that it's long (laughs) enough or you repeat it the chorus often enough. But uh, yeah, I, I found that helped me stay a little more attuned to uh, instead of just mindlessly washing my hands. Absolutely. Doing it focused and, be, and being aware that I was doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I always talk about hand washing to families that have had gastrointestinal illness in the house, because if you've had a gastrointestinal illness, that that bug can still be shedding its infectious agents for two weeks after the symptoms go. So you start after, after the symptoms leave. Wow. So, so you can be sick of, for a week or more and then so, you have right. another two So if weeks? you have a child that has acute diarrhea because of gastrointestinal illness, that child can still be infectious if they touch their stool and their stool gets put onto something and somebody else touches that and then it goes into their mouth or their eyes. So really important to just have a family culture around hand hygiene, especially during illness. But you need to kind of be in that hyper, people usually hyper vigilance for a few days, and then they're like, oh, we're over it. <laughs> but you have to keep washing those hands. Yeah, absolutely. Now that brings up this question um, about the, I'm gonna take sort of a left turn here and go down a rabbit hole, but when you're saying about those two weeks and wash your hands longer, we should wash our hands all the time anyway, but being acutely aware after some sort of, uh, gastrointestinal problem. Uh, let's t- take a left-hand turn here for just a minute and talk about when we're taking natural remedies. I remember you telling me that you have to go a lot longer than you, your brain sort of tells you you should. Yeah. You really need to go quite a bit longer than, it's definitely not just take two in the morning and you'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's so true. You really do need to, it, it's really, I say people, you need to treat right away, like we talked about, you need to take something consistently throughout the day. So really repeat your dose, like every hour or every two hours, you're taking something that is supporting your immune system or decreasing the infectious agent. And then the third thing is super important is to take it even after you feel like you're better. So a lot of people, once they're, they, they may power it down with vitamin C and echinacea or something like that for a day, and their sore throat goes away. And they're like, yeah, great, I'm all better. And then they go out that night, and they have some wine and, and whatever, and they stop taking those things. And then the next day, they are hit so hard with being sick. I know that used to happen to me before I understood this, that you need to take something for at least a few days until after the time that you started feeling better. Now, I'm curious about some of the natural remedies. Uh, I can't remember what they were, but I'd been told that when you have an immune system that's not as strong as you'd like, sometimes you need to be a little bit careful about the different types of things you take. Um, So it's probably best just to talk to your naturopathic doctor who already probably knows that you've got an an immune system that's a bit twitchy. Absolutely. Anything that that I say or we say here uh, is, is just information for you to share with your medical team. I mean, everybody is so individualized, especially when you start talking about chronic illness. We, we may express that illness in individual ways, and it's really important to talk to your medical team and make sure that they know what you're doing and that they can help you make the best choices for yourself. That said, I think what you're talking about is often people who have autoimmune diseases, they're told to not take immune supportive herbs because people are afraid that if you support the immune system and if you have an overactive immune system that it may make your autoimmune disease worse is that maybe what you were thinking yeah, about yeah that's that's what i've heard but uh, you know uh, you hear these things and you don't really know if they're true or not yeah so i think that is a bit of a rabbit hole first of all because we start talking about it and i and i think there is i think there was some over concern about that in my mind. And partly in this, I have this thought, and it's just theoretical at this point, but I am highly suspicious that autoimmune disease is not actually our 
immune system going completely awry and attacking completely healthy cells, but it has more to do with our cells actually holding some sort of infectious agent in it. And the immune system knows that and is going after and attacking our cells because there's something in there. There's Epstein-Barr virus, there's a retrovirus, there's something in there, there's a metal, there's something in there that the body goes is foreign and is attacking yourself for that. So that's where I think the, I am just clinically, I personally have not seen that to be that big of a concern of giving people with autoimmune diseases, immune stimulating herbs. Mm. Well, and okay. I think that possibly it's because it is actually the immune system is not, not working. It's actually working <laughs> and it is beneficial to support it. Uh, I'm a huge believer that this is an amazing healing machine given once you can get it supported the way it's needing to be supported. And the issue is so hard uh, for all of us because each it's each so individualized how it needs to be supported. And I think that's right. constantly surprising me right. for, on all the guests that we have and the community that I hear from. Each one has a different uh, success story. And it's uh, just amazing to me. We need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Jenny about some other things that we can do. And I did take her down a bit of a rabbit hole there. And I want to come back to a, uh, one of my other questions or notes I had, because I found uh, stress reduction, even though having a sick person in the home did heighten my stress. And the more that I spent my time being very mindful and taking care of myself, I felt that I, I'm sure it was just sort of a intuitive or energetic thing, but I felt like I was really supporting my immune system doing that. Let's talk a little bit about how stress reduction and mindfulness can help us stay healthy. I love that you were doing that. And to me, that's just an example of you had your emotional wellness toolkit ready to go. Yeah, this isn't my a tool that, song. <laughs> yeah, but this isn't a tool that you had when I first met you, right? This oh, is something no. that you've collected along the way. And this is what I talk about toolkits is that there's something that we're always building and we're always looking like, oh, maybe that's a tool that works for me. Oh, I don't need that tool anymore. I'm going to put that one out, take that one out of my kit. So you're just a perfect example right there of using your toolkit and using, having tools for your mind body makes a huge impact on your immune system. hundred percent. Absolutely. Well, I know it helped me go to sleep. Uh, it, well, that's the critical thing for me. I find that even if I'm feeling a bit crummy and I'm doing some of the things we talked about, if I'm not getting enough sleep, then I just feel I'm setting myself up for uh, issues down the road. So let's talk a little bit about sleep and the importance of sleep. And everyone, this is whether you think you're going to get the flu, a flu member has a family member has a flu or whatever. I just, I'm a huge fan of sleep once I realized how important it was. So let's talk a little bit about how the importance of sleep and staying well. Sleep is so, it's, it's essential to sleep. If somebody comes to me who's chronically ill, one of the first things I want to look at is their sleep because I know if you're not sleeping, you're not going to heal the way you want to. When we're children, we, we grow at night. There's a growth hormone that comes out and that helps us get bigger when we're kids. When we're adults, we still have that growth hormone and that growth hormone just goes around the body and it starts healing tissues. It heals, it, it clears out, works on your immune system, we're detoxifying and we're healing as we sleep. It's so important on so many levels to get deep restful sleep. If that's not something you have, I really highly recommend that you start focusing on that and figure out what tools you need to get your sleep improved for sure. If you're sick, it's really important to sleep. And sometimes it can be kind of hard to sleep if you're all congested or you have that, I hate that sore throat phase, you know, where the sore throat's so bad, you can't sleep. So in the toolkit, in the PDF guide, I talk about a number of different things to support those symptoms that can help you sleep when you're sick. And the one thing that I'll just have to plug right here now is our warming socks. Warming socks are a great simple technique you can use we use cold wet socks and, and warm wool socks. And I know it sounds insane. It just sounds crazy. Like, what is she talking about? Truly, it's an extremely effective treatment. And that's the only thing I would have added when you came, when you arrived home and you had sick family members and you were doing your mindset work to get yourself to sleep is for you to have done warming socks first because that would have increased your white blood cell count in the nighttime, which would have given you more power to kill off the virus. 
Honestly, I didn't think it would work. So tell, <laughs> I was like, she's nuts. <laughs> she's nuts. So tell the audience what, why I thought you thought. I mean, it does sound strange. But I actually talked to a girlfriend, my longtime massage therapist, known her for like 45 years. And I was telling her, she says, oh, sure. And it really does work. So tell the audience what it is. Oh, so do you want me to explain how to do it? Yes, yes. Please. Okay, okay. So warming socks, and I have a few great testimonials for you guys for warming socks. First, I'll explain how you do these, okay? So you need a pair of cotton socks and a pair of wool socks and hot water. That's all you need. You're going to get your feet really hot. So stand in a bucket of hot water, take a hot shower. I like to take a hot bath because I do that anyway. Get the cotton socks, put the cold put the foot part of the socks under cold water, get them really cold, rig them out, put them aside, get, have your dry socks ready, get your feet nice and hot, dry them off, put on the cold, wet socks, cover them up with the dry wool socks and go straight to bed. I always say, you know, from Monopoly, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to bed. You've already brushed your teeth, you've already said goodbye to your kitty, you know, everything you do before you go to bed. And what happens is that the, the feet get really hot, the blood goes down there, then it puts on the cold and your body goes, oh no, it's cold. We have to put blood all into the central organs or else before she dies. And then it realizes it's not that big of a crisis, but it creates this huge circulation of your blood as you're sleeping and brings down inflammation anywhere from the ankles and above. So ear aches, headaches, insomnia, sore throats, pain. It's amazing, works great for kids. All my kids had warming socks. So that's how you do it. Do you want to hear the testimonials? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I learned this first year of naturopathic medical school. And of course I'm doing it because I'm a really good student and I'm wrapping myself up and looking really weird. My husband is British and male and he was a little bit, every little freaky thing that I came home with, he was always a little suspicious. He started doing the warming socks and it was one of those things that he just consistently did every single time saying, because it worked so well. So even like the recalcitrant British male was like, I've got to do this. We shared how to do this with some of our British friends. One of them happens to work, happens used to work at number 10. Yeah. And was having a, um, having a big, you know, one of those big powerful meetings with all the leaders of the world. And there was a cold going around number 10 on Downing Street. Yes. And so he was doing the warming socks and he ended up explaining to all of these high level people how it was that you do warming socks because it worked so well. And then <laughs> I, I know. I just know what I thought when you first told me about it. Oh my gosh. And then my, my third great testimonial is one of my friends that was calling me for about the third time to say, the kids are sick. What should I do? And this time I said, I'm going to tell you what to do, but this time, if you don't do it, I'm going to charge you for this phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and so he actually did the warming socks that time, called me back the next day and said, it was miraculous. It worked so well. We all got healthy. And for now, I'm always going to do the warming socks and do exactly what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll raise my hand on that one too, but I have to tell you my eyebrows kind of my eyes kind of rolled. But now I'm curious, uh, now, since they work so well, do we, is it harmful to do them every night? Or is this just our secret weapon of our toolbox when we get the scratchy throat and the itchy eyes and uh, uh oh, some people do them every night, and they love them. Other people really don't like them that much. And they just do them when they're sick. So so, okay, so there's no harmful thing yeah. if we choose to do it every night. Okay. Yeah. Other than, I don't know about your love life, but we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, your go there. <laughs> yeah, maybe your partner can get into the wool socks too. Who knows? <laughs> so, oh my gosh, we need to take one more quick commercial break. When Jenny and I get together, time just flies, but we're going to talk about things like diet and other things like that when we get back. What, what we should be eating. Like, I have, I'm always curious, is that, there any truth to that apple a day and other, all the, wives tales about that so we'll be right back how to stay healthy during through cold and flu season i had a family member come back from an airplane flight just got so sick wouldn't listen to me but i didn't get sick now they listen to me so I, and i listened to dr jenny because she's been a long time member of my wellness journey and my wellness team actually she was one of the members of, from the very beginning of uh, shortly right after the diagnosis so anyway dr jenny 
One of the things I hear a lot about is, of course, we all should have a good diet, regardless of whether you're getting the flu or cold, but just every day, you know, eating more veggies and things like that. But is there any truth to that certain fruits and vegetables can absolutely help us get over something? Like, what about that old wife's tale, an apple a day? I think that it's so important to eat fruits and vegetables every single day. I, I hate to kind of bulk on this question, but I am a little bit just because as a physician, there's never everybody should do all the same thing, right? So yeah. in terms of an apple a day should keep, can keep the doctor away, I think eating fresh fruits and vegetables is really beneficial for your immune system, and that's been proven over and over again. There's a small select group of people who are actually fructose intolerant, and so for them, eating that apple is gonna cause gas and bloating in their digestive system, and, and, and it's gonna be problematic for them. But for most people, yes, eating fruits and vegetables every day is definitely gonna support your immune system. You get micronutrients in there, you get really good levels of vitamin C. It's super important to eating fresh vegetables. And what about this idea of the eat the rainbow? So I should be eating the oranges, orange fruits like, or, and veggies like carrots and squash and things like that, as well as the greens and, and because sometimes there are certain ones that I have to admit, there's certain colored vegetables as I'm thinking about them. I don't really like them. I'm not a fan. <laughs> it's sort of like the whole color group I'm not a fan of. So what about- Which color group is that that you don't like? The reds. I really you don't like the into, reds. I'm not into tomatoes or red peppers or things like that. But I love carrots. I love the orange, you know, the squashes, yeah. and pumpkins and all so of how that. About, how about beets and red chard? You know, it's funny. Beets make my nose run. Uh, so. Interesting. So yeah, they're not great for you. So yeah, interesting. Yeah. So it's funny. I kind of tend to avoid those, but I, I try yeah. to eat a wide variety except those. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. I, I actually, I'm a huge fan of the rainbow of fruits and vegetables. It's really important because each one of those colors means that it's carrying a different nutrient complex in there. And each one of those nutrient complex is is beneficial to your body. It's going to help you detoxify. It's going to help you build up your cells, support your immune system. Each one is really has some powerful antioxidant in it. So yeah, eat as much as you can. But of course, if you're sensitive to something, then you can't eat that right now until you heal that sensitivity. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I love about uh, the fruits and vegetables. I mean, it's just a farmer's... I, we live near a farmer's market. I just love it because it, it's even a feast for the eyes. Oh, so, so beautiful, I, yeah. I've got another question about diet, though, that I've got here on my notes that I'm curious. Um, I know when I, I, I haven't become a fanatic about no sugar. I mean, if, I, if it's like in something, I'm not absolutely going to freak out. But I really no longer seek out sugar, shall I say. And I'm curious, I've been told that sugar can depress your immune system, like when you have a cold or a flu. Is, is there any truth to that? 100% truth to that. Yeah, it can depress your immune system anytime, even if you're not sick. The studies show that about half a cup of sugar, 100 grams of sugar, can suppress your macrophages. That's part of your white blood cell that are, they, they are the ones that eat the, the bacteria, the viruses, or the fungus. It depletes them. They just can't, they don't, they're not able to function anymore for about four to six hours. So when people are going and getting their pumpkin latte and their banana bread, and then they have lunch and they get something, you know, some sort of dessert for lunch, and then they have a snack, you know, they have a muffin and some other kind of latte thing as a snack, and then they go in to have dinner and have dessert or ice cream after, you know, after dinner, that means that they're consistently depleting their white blood cells as they go. Clearly not a great situation to support your immune system anytime at all. And it's a really big issue, of course, around the holidays because there's so much more sugar around for everybody. It's sort of part of the culture. And it's also cold and flu season. So you're decreasing your immune system and then you're hanging out where there, when there are a lot more viruses. So I feel like we're setting ourselves up for illness in that situation. Wow, I'm thinking that, yes, yeah, going, just going to the office party or your friend's house where you're around more people than you normally would be. Yeah. Uh, and there's probably, you know, more handshaking. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, it makes you want to stay home. <laughs> so, <laughs> have it that way. You know, I'm curious about, though, uh, if we are, if we get off sugar, shall we say, we just say, okay, I'm going to try and stay away from sugar. How, does it take a long time for those little microphages 
to regrow or I don't know, do, the come back? Macrophages. Does it, yeah. does so it doesn't actually, from? yeah, so it actually doesn't kill the macrophage. Was it, what it does is uh, it's, it's quite interesting because the sugar molecule uh, looks a lot like vitamin C. So what those macrophages, one of the reasons we need vitamin C, we need those fresh fruits and vegetables. And often we need to increase our levels of vitamin C during a time of illness or when we're stressed out is because those macrophages use vitamin C inside of themselves to actually kill the virus or the bacteria, the fungus. It's like, that's their deadly poison it has to do with vitamin C. Sugar molecule looks a lot like the vitamin C molecule. So the macrophages in their pure innocence, grab the sugar molecule and stick that inside themselves. And then they're shooting blanks. They're not able to kill that virus because the virus is like, hey, sugar, I'm cool. Like, I can still survive <laughs> now. Thank you very much for that treat. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So it doesn't take very long then once we get it out of our system. Then... Not that I'm aware of. You know, honestly, I don't, the, the study that I was reading about this, uh, I didn't, it didn't talk about how long it takes to come back after you've in ingested sugar. I will say that sugar is like one of the most addictive substances out there. And so people who are really used to having sugar in their body, it can take at least 10 to 14 days before the cravings stop, which is often, I often suggest people uh, talk to your doctor, but see if glutamine might be a good option because glutamine can really help decrease those sugar cravings. And it also heals your gut, your leaky gut at the same time. I love things that do more than one thing that are beneficial. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, since we're talking about leaky gut, um, is there any, I've heard about the sugars that there are certain par parts of the bacteria and stuff that really kind of crave sugar that we try to get rid of. And that's part of the, why it's so hard to get off of it, because certain of the not so friendly bacteria are kind of screaming, feed me, feed me. They are. Yes. So there's the whole thing about the microbiome. There are more cells that aren't us than are us in and on our body, which is always such an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> yeah, and, we're... yeah, we're just carriers. <laughs> we're just carrying <laughs> these little things around. <laughs> so yes, many of the critters in your microbiome in your digestive tract, if you have what's called dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of your good and bad gut bacteria, I always think about like a, being a bad neighborhood where you've got these bad dudes and they're just partying and they want more sugar to party on. And so they're just like, hey, psst, you know, feed us the sugar so we can have a good time and replicate. Mm. <laughs> so, I remember that part. I kept feeling like I would do some mindfulness work around when I was getting off sugar. Mm. I would have to do some mindfulness around it, just calm myself down. When I start hearing in my head sort of this screaming, sugar, sugar. I, yeah. I would visualize, I can't remember the name of the movie with that great big plant that just screamed, you know, feed me, feed me. <laughs> I would visualize <laughs> that and then go and do some, some meditation. And I found that helped a lot just to, to distract my mind from that um, cry of feed me, feed me. <laughs> I, think, I think that's great that you used your mind for that. And, and I, I think the power of the mind is huge. And and when we talk about, you've talked, mentioned a few times how, well, there's all those viruses out there. That sounds really scary. It's easy to get into a fear and victim mindset when we start thinking about how much is out there that could make us sick. And especially I know that when we are in our big valleys of our health, you know, we're in that place where we're really struggling, it's easy to feel super vulnerable and ill and easy to get sick. And that's where I think you can really bring in the power of your mind, like build up that toolkit for mindfulness so that you can use your power of your mind to boost your immune system and keep yourself from getting sick. Mm, absolutely. And I like to change it up every so often. I'll do some yoga or other things. I've got some really fun DVDs where it's not just a, a, there's some meditation part to it and then there's some movement part to it. And I find that I'm not sure people would technically call that exercise, but it is to me. It's you're stretching and you're moving about and building Sorry. some muscle a little bit. Um, the exercise help us get well? It's a great question. It really depends on how sick you are and what the state of your body is and how much exercise you're talking about. It's certainly easy to over-exercise if you're feeling sick, but in, in Chinese medicine, they talk about if you just have a cold, it's really good to keep your body moving and to just even go out for a walk. So I think doing something to tolerance, to what feels good is actually extremely beneficial. The stretching that you're talking about is great 
because that's moving your muscles. It's moving your lymphatic system and your lymph muscles and your lymphatic, when you move your muscles, it helps move your lymphatic system, which helps support your immune system. Mm, yes. And I recently took a class in Qigong mm. and I was really impressed at how that, all this sort of light, it wasn't hard guys, it was really simple. <laughs> and what I loved about it, nothing stressful on the body about it. It was really delightful. Mm. But as I noticed some of the movements, I said, well, I think this is probably sort of moving the fascia and, and which would in turn move the lymph around just by these simple movements. So I, I want you guys to explore that too, because that was fascinating. Oh yeah. I love some of those different amazing ancient arts. They're so powerful in their healing and they move the physical and the emotional and the energetic body. So they help you on all the levels. They open up so much for deep healing. It's great. Oh yeah. And this was a great class. Uh, he did, a, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes of the movement. And then we had 10 minutes of meditation and then oh, some poetry time. Oh, People lovely. either wrote, sat and wrote poetry quietly or somebody was reading poetry. It was really lovely. So I yeah. suggest just getting out there made me feel healthier too. Getting out yeah. in community. <laughs> so yes. here we are on one side talking about, oh, being afraid of going into community. But when I walked away from that community, I felt so much better, so much more centered. It's interesting you say that when we were talking about the digestive system, one thing that can happen in the gut for people who are ill, especially when we're stressed, is that for chronically ill people or chronically stressed people, which is pretty much everybody out there in the world today is chronically stressed, you have a depletion of your immune globulin A, which is the immune globulin that's in all of your mucous membranes. Just driving down the road and slamming on the brakes to avert an accident will decrease your secretory IgA. But one of the things that increases that secretory IgA is actually doing exactly what you, you did, being out in community, moving your body. So dancing, drumming, singing, any of those types of things will actually increase your secretory IgA and increase your immune system. So you just, I think that's partly what you were feeling. Just oh, like yeah. You know I good for you. <laughs> came away going, oh, that's great. It was my first time at the class and I'm definitely going again because I so enjoyed it. And that was wonderful. Well, we're down just to the last eight minutes, Dr. Jenny. Time flies when we're together. Um, any final thoughts? I know one of the things I just quickly, if you want to talk to about it, because I've always been in, heard about um, like, I, I maybe hydrotherapy is not the right word, but you know, like salt water and your nose and your throat and all that kind of thing. How, how does we water make us healthy, healthy besides washing our hands? Oh, there's so much we can do with water. I love hydrotherapy because it's so simple. So the warming socks are one example of hydrotherapy. You're just using water and some socks to get better. Doing nasal lavage, neti pot, is, can be a great way of Healing, if you have a sinus infection, oh my gosh, it makes such a difference to just do that neti pot to clear out the sinus congestion through there. But it's also a really great way to decrease your viral load. So doing a neti pot can be a great immune defense for a lot of people. Yeah, be sure and ask your doctor or, or, and treatment yeah. advisor on how to do yeah. that because it's not the simplest to figure out from the instructions. It's not. It's not. I had my doctor show me the first time I did it. He's like, you have to lean way over the sink and tilt your head and do this. I so appreciated how graphic he was when he described that to me. I'm sure you can YouTube it. And just honestly, if, you're, if you have the stamina for this and you can do it, ending your hot showers in a little bit of cool can make a really big difference in supporting your immune system over the long term and just having that in your toolkit. Whenever I take a sauna or take a hot shower, I always end it in cold and it feels great. But I couldn't do that when I was really, when I, my adrenals and my hypothalamic pituitary axis, when that was really depleted. So talk to your doctor before you do it. Yeah, but no, I, you know, I do that all the time now. I've forgotten that that's part of the toolbox. Right. <laughs> Because I just do it all the time now. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I guess the toolbox is becoming part of my that's, everyday thing. That, and that's what, I, that's what I often talk about with the toolkit, because at first, whenever you're changing a habit, it feels like it's a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. You kind of have to get over your resistance, like yours to the warming socks. But then once you do something, and then once you start, and you get the feed, positive feedback from it, and then you do it on a regular basis, it becomes habit. And then after something like 66 days, habit becomes you. It's really great. And that's how we continue to up-level our state of health through time when we consistently bring in new tools that we try out and we, and we integrate into our lives. 
Mm, absolutely. And the key part there is I like to journal because sometimes, as Jenny knows, I'll be doing something and I'm like, wow, Dr. Jenny, this is really working. Great, great, great. And then you get feeling really great and something happens and I'll call it you cheat. If you go somewhere, like especially this time of year, somebody offers you Aunt Mabel's favorite cookies or something and you cheat. And then I find it's so much easier to cheat the next day and cheat the next day to the point that I forget. What was it that I was just doing a few weeks ago that made me feel so awesome? So I like to journal because then I can go back and remember, oh, that's what I was doing. And there's where I got off track. That's a great idea. Yeah. And I actually think that when you are healing and if you're, if you've been, if you're really, really sick, you tend to do everything just to the T perfect that you're supposed to do for your health because you're really trying to get out of that trough, right? But then as you start to get better, it's easy to think, oh, I could just do this. I've certainly done this with myself. It's like, oh, maybe I could just have this or eat this thing and I'll be fine. And then you realize like, mm, nope, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> or like you said, maybe just once, maybe not the second and the third time. Right? Exactly. I mean, it's so easy to convince ourselves to do these little cheats, as I call them. And, and then yeah. later we find out, doggone, it shouldn't have done that. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So, oh my gosh, we, I took you down another rabbit hole there. I'm, I'm just famous for that. But down to about five minutes, tell us uh, any final thoughts that you want to share and then how people can find out more about you and to get that amazing PDF on cold and flu strategies. Well, I just really, wherever you are in your healing journey, I just want you to know that you have the ability to get better. I just really, truly believe that in my heart and that it's really just a process of exploring of having the curious mind and listening to podcasts like this, listening to other podcasts, researching, talking to your physicians and finding the answers that will work for you so that you can build that toolkit that gets you your vitality back so that you're able to figure out your path back to healing. Uh, you know, Sharon stands as an example of somebody who's healed. There are many of us who have healed and I know it can be so discouraging when you're down there and you don't even have the energy to think, let alone figure out how you can get better. But I just want to say, you know, we've been there. I've been there. Sharon's been there. A lot of us have been there. And, and I know that you're going to be able to get yourself back to a higher level of health. Just stay on the journey. In terms of colds and flus, you don't need to be afraid. I suggest that you just download the PDF. In there, I have this mindset trick that I use. I've used it so many times. I had a fever of 101 and I applied this mindset trick and it went away within an hour. So I, the, the, the tips in there are ones that I've used myself with my patients for 20 years. Highly recommend you check it out. And if you want to hear more from me, you can find me at my website at drjennytofankian.com. So that's drjennytofankian, T-U, F as in Frank, E, N as in Nancy, K-I-N.com. Or you can also see me, find me on Instagram at drjennytofankian, or on Facebook at Dr. Jenny to thank you. And we'll have the spelling of her name up there on Understanding Autoimmune, as well as with the audio and the YouTube, the video portion of it, if you'd rather watch that. Because sometimes I know you're either driving or walking or doing something, and you're like, oh my gosh, but just check out understandingautoimmune.com to find her website. So you can pop over to her website drjennytofankian.com to get that great PDF, as well as find out more about her and all the other things she does. She's giving a, a putting together some courses on overcoming chronic fatigue syndrome, which I think is so misunderstood. And I'm, I can't wait for that to come out. That's coming out at the first of the year. And we're going to have Dr. Jenny back on when she's going to announce that because too, too often people are told it's all in our head. And gosh, here on the Autoimmune Hour, our Courage Club members know that's not true. And Dr. Jenny is going to have some great tips and things in the, in the new year for us about, for those of us overcoming chronic fatigue. And one of the things I love is sometimes you don't have to have chronic fatigue to be able to take a lot of the tips and things that are offered. Because as we know here, we talk about optimizing. This isn't about headlong diving into the, trying to find that elusive word cure. So every day we optimize, every day we optimize. And pretty soon before you know it, you're feeling awesome. 
And as I say, I don't care that some of my doctors will shake their finger and say, Sharon, you're not cured. I always go, I don't care. I feel great. <laughs> you know, whatever works. And the, the word's not important to me. So it, it, Jenny, thank you so much for being here and sharing this timely topic with us so we can all stay healthy and enjoy the holiday season and our families and our friends during this really wonderful time. Everyone, have a great week. Whatever your adventures, join me next week for another brand new episode. Join us over at understandingautoimmune.com. It's also Understanding Autoimmune on Instagram and Facebook, as well as Twitter. So you can find us at all of those. Reach out to us on social media. We love to hear your thoughts and your healing journey. Have a great week. Whatever your adventures, join me next week. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio.